welcome, and thank you for joining in the second Community Voices conversation this fall. It is particularly poignant for me to follow the wonderful presentation given last month by Nancy Agee, President and CEO of Carillion Clinic. Her presentation around servant leadership for community change will truly be continued this month as we explore the topic of youth in foster care. It has truly been a privilege to work with the Institute of Policy and Governance to put this program together. Andy, thank you. We are here this evening to bring attention and hopefully action to a little known population, older youth in foster care. In order to do so, I will be sharing a little about the foster care system, the services available to older youth, and how youth are doing as they leave the system. As a social worker, I have worked in and around the foster care system for more than 15 years. I have also raised three children into adulthood, one of them adopted at age 16. I have always been drawn to working with children and youth. Ever since I hit youth group stage at my own church, I've been leading groups of teens for something somewhere. So you might think I would have this work with youth figured out. Yet I continue to be surprised and amazed every day. Surprised by the situations that youth endure at the hands of the people who are supposed to love them best. And amazed at their resilience and strength to get out of bed day after day to continue to press forward. One of my least and most favorite encounters was with an early elementary aged boy who was living in a shack with his parents and siblings. No plumbing no electricity. He could not or would not speak. He had never been to school, yet his smile when given attention was as big as this room. Through many slow steps, he was prepared to attend school, and with a lot of remediation, he began to learn. And once he began learning, the pace was incredible. He was wrapped with a good foster family and a mentor and in-home counseling. He did a lot of catching up, and I've learned he is about to graduate from high school just one year late. Attention, a lot of individualized work, time, patience, caring. This was not accomplished by social workers, but by the folks in this boy's community who reached out to take him in and build a relationship, earn his trust, and see him through. Not every child or youth story is so dramatic but many are. For those unfamiliar with the foster care system, it is important to understand that when someone under the age of 18 is found to be abused, neglected, or abandoned by their direct caregiver, or if they are frequently truant from school, they are usually placed in the custody and care of their local Department of Social Services. They become a ward of the state. Through no fault of their own, youth suddenly find themselves in foster care. The Virginia Department of Social Services foster care policy defines youth as those persons age 14 to 21. Departments are encouraged to offer independent living skills training as a part of their case management duties, though no additional staff is provided to do this. The Commonwealth is ahead of the curve in extending services to youth under age 16 and beyond age 18, which is a hopeful sign. Though youth who turn 18 are no longer in the custody of a local department, services to promote permanency and independent living success can be provided until a youth turns 21. And if a youth is pursuing post-secondary education or training of any kind, there are federal education and training funds available of up to $5,000 per youth per year until a youth turns 23. In addition, the Virginia tuition grant for community college education will cover whatever a youth's Pell Grant will not. Another spot of hope. As the regional program consultant with Project Life, I get to work with social workers in public and private agencies along with the youth they serve to enhance services provided to young people as they grow, mature, and prepare for their futures as adults. We are working hard to respect and empower those whom we serve, the youth who find themselves a part of the foster care system, their families and those who care for youth when they cannot live with their own families. We are striving to improve the prospects of youth in foster care as they become young adults and citizens in our communities. 
But if we are going to give youth the solid footing, typical of the average youth of today, we need your help. While the intent of the foster care system is to provide safety and protection through temporary custody and placement, often children and youth enter care, as we call it, and then spend several years in the system before their family is stabilized or an appropriate permanent placement is found for them, they are literally growing up in foster care. Communities used to have orphanages to care for their young people in foster care. Back in the early 1900s, an orphanage was a large residential institution, a huge building with hundreds of children living in barracks or dormitory style housing. Due to the numbers, life in the orphanage was very structured and without individualized care and treatment children who suffer neglect and abuse require. By the mid-1900s, psychiatrists and researchers were figuring out that living in an orphanage tended to institutionalize children. That is to say, children and youth, deprived of independence and responsibility over time, become unable to manage the demands of everyday life. They experience what is known as institutionalized syndrome, which refers to the social and life skills deficits and disabilities that result but at least the orphan in an orphanage was visible. People certainly knew that kids lived there, and even today we can feel compassion for the orphans when we think of them. There are not many true orphans, orphanages in the United States any longer, none that I know of in Virginia, but we could certainly continue to have orphans. The orphan of today is the child or youth whose parents are deceased or who has been abandoned by their biological parent or had their parents' rights terminated by the court. Often they are older children. We are learning that youth 14 and over may actually want to be adopted and that there are those who wish to adopt them. I recently learned of just such a situation in a community near here. A young man's community college instructor took a particular interest in him and after getting to know him a little better is making the way for him to join her family. That's how it happens, you know. Connection, relationship, success. Now that particular young adult has a consistent, committed adult figure in his life. The foster care system of today is made up of children and youth who are unable to live with their own nuclear or even extended family. Some spend time in residential treatment facilities, some in small group homes, but most are placed with foster families, all under the supervision and support of the local Department of Social Services. Some foster families adopt the children and youth they foster. Then we must find more foster families. Youth who are older when they enter foster care find it especially difficult. These are young people who have been living, surviving, in less than ideal circumstances. They have started forming their own opinions and ways of doing things and have begun to think about how their life is going to be. Then they are uprooted and placed with people they do not know and in situations where they have no familiarity. It may be necessary for their safety and the new situations where they have, I'm sorry, and the new situation may in fact be a better one. Yet sometimes they don't respond very well. And when they don't respond very well, well, who wants to care for a teen who is in shock, rebellious, hurt, and angry? You know the saying, wow, he's a mess. Well, that often about sums it all up. You tell me consistently that they don't feel wanted, they, that someone is a social worker for a paycheck, that their foster parents don't really like them, it seems to the youth that they are invisible. Oh, after some time, we might be forced to notice them because they will start getting into trouble or cause trouble or become a problem. Problems get noticed. In our society, problems tend to become statistics. Across the United States, evidence shows us that youth who leave foster care at 18 or 19 struggle even harder than the typical youth just to survive the most current stat is that, the, that youth who are leaving their parents' home and are financially stable are 27 years, six months old. But youth are required every day to exit the foster care system at 18, 19, 20 years old. The Commonwealth of Virginia has achieved the dubious notice of our federal government for ranking 50th out of our 50 states in the category of 
youth transitioning out of care successfully. On average, 12% of the youth who report they have no positive adult connection and leave foster care at age 18 find themselves homeless within a year. Many become pregnant, others incarcerated, most are unemployed. In Virginia, we know that only 2 to 3% of the youth who exit foster care attempt any training or education beyond high school, that is, if they graduate high school. Many youth in foster care move around from place to place so often that coursework is missed, semesters are lost, and the typical four years of high school take six years. Would you like to be an 18-year-old ninth or 10th grader? So you, youth get their GED, or once they turn 18, they simply drop out. And of the 2 to 3% who enroll in community college, university, or trade school, in Virginia, less than 1% finish their, more than their first semester. The demands of classes are more than they are prepared to handle. I have often wondered, if a young person isn't succeeding in high school, what makes us think they will succeed in community college or a trade school? We can probably all agree that knowledge is power. Education is the key to success. For youth in foster care to master their education, they need a lot of support. Across Virginia and right here in the New River Valley, youth are in trouble. Every day, youth turn 18 and on the same day decide to leave foster care. Sometimes they have a place to live, a job, maybe even a plan for their education, but most of the time they do not. They leave because they are in the developmental stage of being independent. They are fed up with being told what to do. They want to be allowed to make their own decisions, they might make the wrong decision, they might fail, but they want the chance, and when they mess up, when they want, then they want to be given another chance, and another, and maybe even another. That is normal, isn't it? Youth leave the foster care system with a slam of the door, determined not to look back. They are atop their horse and riding off into the proverbial sunset. Only for the majority, rather than a sunset, a tornado of day-to-day -day living demands hits them broadside. Sometimes, because they have no training and can't get a job and are sick of the system and tired of asking for help, they end up prostituting or selling drugs or stealing just to survive. Imagine the impact that this is having on our community and imagine the impact that our community could have on youth transitioning to adulthood who just need a caring adult to encourage and guide them. What might we do to support youth who need education, training, a job, affordable housing, and myriad of daily living skills? The problem of poor outcomes in our youth exiting the foster care system has been noticed. That is how I stand before you this evening as a member of the Project Life team. And that is where you, as a community, have the opportunity to make a difference. It is widely acknowledged across the nation that the foster care system is broken. I will admit that national child welfare data runs at least two years behind. And even more unfortunate, there is just not a lot of research. Over the past several years, however, Casey Family Programs and Chapin Hall at the University of Chicago, along with others, have been working to gather information to inform policymakers and stakeholders about how to improve foster care services and social work practice on a national front. Findings from these various researchers have culminated in action from the federal government. In an effort to bolster the outcomes of older youth, in October 2010, the federal government initiated the collection of data provided through a direct survey of the youth receiving services. This is the first time this has ever been done. Data about older youth's experiences has begun to be collected in a formal manner directly from the youth across the United States in order to create a national youth and transition database. This data collection will continue into 2018 in order to provide longitudinal, sound documentation representative of the true experiences and needs of transitioning older youth. This is a great initiative, but our youth cannot wait until 2018 for data results and new programs. They need our help now. And even as I say this, things have begun to change.
The Virginia Department of Social Services has taken steps over the past three years to transform their delivery of services to families and children by adopting a new practice model. We left our timeline a few minutes ago back in the mid-1900s. Who remembers what you were doing in, say, 1985? Where were you? At what stage of life were you in? I remember where I was quite clearly. I had just graduated with my bachelor's degree and gotten married all in the same year. My husband and I were attempting to manage a newly opened camp and conference center in the mountains above Denver, Colorado. I felt very alone and out of my element and scared, but it was nothing compared to what youth in foster care face every day. For our older youth in foster care, the year 1985 was po is pivotal. In 1985, a young man named Willie Palmer was emancipated from foster care at age 18 in the state of New York. He was discharged to himself, sent out the door to the sidewalk with a garbage bag holding some of his things. Willie was homeless, unemployed, and without any skills. In 1987, after two years of struggling to survive, Willie sued the state of New York so that no other youth like him would ever be discharged from foster care to the streets. Willie won his case, and we celebrate this as the genesis of the independent living movement. It still took over 10 years for nationwide legislation to be enacted, and sadly, Willie died on the streets of New York a few years after his victory. Independent living services across Virginia, as well as throughout the nation, are primarily driven today by an act signed into law by President Clinton as the John H. Chafee Foster Care Independence Program on December 14, 1999. This action in large part provides the funding that local departments use to offer independent living services. When attempting to meet the needs of youth, you will hear of Chafee funding or Chafee dollars. A Child Welfare League white paper identified an point in time study on September 29, 2009, that there were 423,773 children in foster care throughout the United States. You might see this figure written as 500,000. They like to round up. Of those, about 33% or one-third were older youth. In Virginia, at the end of August this year, 2,989 youth aged 14 to 21 were in custody or receiving services. In Southwest Virginia, which is my region, 227 youth in foster care are 14 to 21. And in the New River Valley, made up of Radford City, Giles, Floyd, Pulaski, and Montgomery counties, where we sit pretty comfortably this evening, 71 youth aged 14 to 21 are counted as part of the foster care system that struggles every day to meet their needs, even with available Chafee funds. One point that I am compelled to share is that children and youth in foster care receive their health, vision, dental, mental, and physical health care under Medicaid. Since a youth who is 18 is not technically in the custody of the department, they are not literally in foster care and their Medicaid coverage is jeopardized. After the Foster Care Independence Act was enacted in 1999, states were allowed to expand their Medicaid coverage for youth until age 21, so that it would not automatically end when a youth turned 18. However, to date, Virginia has not elected to extend this coverage. Therefore, many youth struggle to have access to health care or just don't have health insurance. Virginia is making a concerted effort to, move, to more quickly return children to their families when appropriate. And departments are taking steps to find meaningful relationships and permanent connections for children and youth through placement with relatives or adoption. Virginia is completing adoptions for children in record numbers, and this is another really positive sign. Yet nationally, each year, an estimated 20,000 young people leave foster care at age 18 or 19 with no formal or documented connection to family or even appropriate adult supports. Not only are youth sorely in need of these permanent relationships, they are in need of quality services and guidance, adult connections, to ensure their success. These are the youth I am most concerned about and bring before you today. 
Statistical research has shown us that the most important factor in a young person's healthy development is a positive relationship with an adult. Even just one adult that a youth can rely on makes a tremendous impact. We learned from the orphanage experience that children and youth who have experienced trauma, who have been abused or neglected, need help forming these relationships. They don't trust adults. They need individual and individualized attention and support to learn the life skills they need. Youth who age out of the system without a family or a positive adult connection or relationship to rely on or return to are more likely to experience negative outcomes including poverty, homelessness, incarceration, addiction, pregnancy, and mental and physical illness. They generally lack the life and educational skills necessary to live successful independent lives. The latest Virginia Department of Social Services foster care policy released just last November 2010 addresses these issues head on for our youth. Serving older youth actually has a whole chapter in policy now. Project Life is working hard to help youth across the state find their voice and express their needs. Youth across the state share that they are very interested in learning the skills necessary to be successful, yet they wish they had someone who would help them learn who is not paid to care about them. They also express the desire to learn experientially. Virginia's child welfare transformation mantra includes children grows best in families. Short of having their own biological family, youth are asking to be supported and guided by people in their own community who care about who they are and what they become. A little later, you may hear Rochelle tell you the story of attending a planning meeting with a bunch of older adults talking about providing independent living skills workshops for the New River Valley. Hopefully, she will tell you about meeting a woman who has volunteered to help her acquire those 45 dreaded driving hours she needs in order to get her license. This individual is giving of her own time and resources to build a relationship with a youth and provide her the opportunity to achieve a treasured milestone, a milestone and a skill and a connection that will serve her the rest of her life. Other areas youth need to learn about include practical daily living skills, communication skills, work and study skills, how to find, get, and keep a job, career planning, home life. You get the idea. Youth need people in their hometown who are close by, people who know where they're coming from and who are willing to enter into relationship with them and stay there for the long haul. Youth are often placed outside of their own communities because there just aren't enough options close to home. Youth do tell us that they would really like to stay in familiar surroundings, in their own hometowns, in their communities, to belong, to give back. They tell us they need contacts and resources when they have a flat tire, are between jobs, or when their day is just going all wrong. My own son telephoned me recently to say he was having a really bad day. The kicker was when he said, I just needed to hear a nice voice. You, young people need to experience that power of connection, of relationship, the encouraging word, the give and take. They need to sense the commitment and interest from a supportive adult. That is what our older youth in foster care are looking for. It is what they need and deserve. Therein lies our opportunity. What is it you're good at and could share with a youth? Do you have a business or agency that serves youth in some way? Do you have a youth on your board or your advisory committee? Are you able to offer a youth an internship or apprenticeship? Often the department can provide a job coach to support a youth in their first job, but they can't create the job opportunity. Our local departments of social services and other pro private providers need your help. Maybe you aren't comfortable being around youth one-on-one. -on -one. Are you good at writing grants? If you just Google grants for youth aging out of foster care, pages and pages of options come up for housing program ideas, entrepreneurial options, mentoring programs, one-stop shops that provide a variety of services under one roof. Could you write a grant or help design a program for the New River Valley? Are you good at coordinating agency efforts? 
a group of agencies banded together in Denver, Colorado to create a program called Bridge the Gap for youth in foster care that provided housing assistance, financial education, job shadowing, support and coaching, scholarships, and matching savings account donors all under one roof. Another project, the Youth in Transition Community Initiative of Forsyth County in North Carolina, described their effort this way. Youths aging out of foster homes will be helped with housing support, financial training, and mentoring. As a community, we must help these youth. Without our help, they could join the already swelled ranks of the homeless. I agree, and I hope you do too. We are going to shift our focus now to the youth panel to hear directly from Rochelle, Summer, and Shane. Their stories will help us understand what youth need and how we can provide it. I challenge you to listen, really listen, and engage them in conversation. As you depart this evening, we have in the lobby Family Preservation Services, Great Expectations, DePaul Community Resources, Project Life, and NRV Cares. Ask them how you can get involved. Thank you. Thank you, Norma, for helping us understand foster care a bit more and what we can do to make it the vital caring service that I think we can all agree we need it to be. I'm Sarah Lyon Hill. I'm a graduate student in the Urban and Regional Planning Program, and I'm a member of the Community Voices Organizing Team. Norma, we greatly appreciate your leadership and vision for supporting youth as they transition, go through, and transition out of the foster care system. Um, again, thank you. Norma, your insights and suggestions are a great way to prepare us to meet our community uh, conversation panel as they join me on the stage and take their seats. Um, they are Victor Horton, the panel moderator, and our panel and our panel members who are in foster care, Shane Lawrence, Summer Lawrence, and Rochelle Newman. Good evening. Um, my name is Victor Horton, and I'll be serving as the moderator for this community conversation. Um, as you can see from your program, um, I have a little bit of experience with the foster care um, system, um, being a member uh, at age six weeks old, and I aged out at 21. Um, I'm a Pulaski County native and a 2010 graduate from Virginia State University. I'm a very uh, passionate about um, youth in foster care, and I've worked with various organizations, such as the Orphan Foundation of America, uh, the Congressional Coalition on Adoption Institute, and the Foster Care Alumni Association. Um, currently, I'm serving um, as a mission technician at uh, Radford University. Uh, the way the program's going to go today is that I'm going to ask our panelists uh, a few questions. Um, we'll first ask them to introduce themselves, and then ask them a few questions that I have, and then I'm going to open up to you, the audience. Um, so I ask that if you have a question, just uh, raise your hand, and um, I'll point to you, and an usher will come to you with a mic. Um, so to begin with, um, we have uh, Shane Lawrence here. Um, I just want to ask you to briefly just tell us your name, uh, where you're from, and describe briefly how you became into the foster care system. Um, I'm Shane. Uh, I'm 17. I currently live in Salem. Um, I've been in foster care for six months now, and I came into care because my mom passed away. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Summer? Um, I'm Summer Lawrence. I'm 17. I live in Roanoke, Virginia. Um, I've been in foster care for six months because my mother passed away. And Rochelle. I'm Rochelle Newman. I am 18 years old. Uh, I currently live in Blacksburg. I've been in foster care for almost two years and I was placed into the foster care system because I was in a, an abusive household. Thank you for sharing. Um, the next question I have for you is <clears throat> just uh, tell us, you know, how your life changed when you had came into the foster care system and what obstacles you had to overcome. I know personally that when I first entered into one of my homes, there were complications with even down to the religion that they believed, uh, to the foods we ate, things like that. So um, 
Um, Rochelle, if you want to touch on that and share your experience. Uh, foster care actually helped me to be a better person. But uh, the obstacles that I did face, uh, the foster parents aren't allowed to let the foster kids drive. And being 18, I would love to just drive wherever. <laughs> but I can't do that. Um, <clears throat> as Norma did say, uh, I did go to a meeting and someone offered to help me drive. She had never met me before, but she trusted me enough to allow me to drive her vehicles. And uh, moving from place to place, it, that was very hard too. So. Okay. Summer, what about you? Um, foster care helped me mature. I think um, the, the two obstacles that I encountered was um, school and the food that some of my foster parents ate. <laughs> I didn't. Okay, and <clears throat> if that was a problem, how did you communicate it, or were you able to communicate um, that with them? I was able, I communicated that I didn't eat red meat, um, but the first foster home did not listen to me. They was like, you eat the meat that we cook or you're not going to eat. Oh, wow. So, um, but the um, second foster home I was in, was pretty okay about it. Like she fed, like she fixed me a separate meal if they were gonna have red meat. Okay. And Shane, what about you? Um, I've had uh, foster care has shown me um, leadership, not only in uh, my personal life but in uh, a public life. Um, and the obstacles I had to come overcome is I've been in six different high schools since I've been a freshman. And some of my credits haven't transferred. That's why I'm not a senior this year, and I'm a junior. Mm -hmm. So I've had that obstacle, and um, my eligibility for football might be at jeopardy. Okay. So that's another obstacle. Um, you two had mentioned that you, you know, jumped from schools to schools. Did you ever have trouble, you know, meeting new friends, things like that? Did that complicate it, or? No, um, I, I can make friends very easy. Um, it's just, yeah, I have to build up the courage to actually talk to you. Yeah. You summer? Um, I can make friends easily after, like, a month of being in a situation. I have to get used to everything, and then I can start making friends. And I usually make a lot of friends. Okay. I just got to get used to it. All right. Um, my next question would be, um, do you feel prepared for the next step in your life? Um, a lot of you, you know, you're about ready to transition out. So do you feel um, prepared for the next step in your life? And if not, do you feel as the system has failed you? Rochelle? Uh, I do feel like I'm not prepared so much for the outside world. Um, <laughs> and I do think that the system has failed me a lot because like normal kids who are not in the foster care system you know, they have their parents to teach them, you know, you have to budget, you know, how to drive, all that. And you just don't get that in foster care until, you know, a few months before you are about to age out. Uh -huh. What about you? Um, I don't think anybody's really prepared for the next step. I mean, not, not just people in foster care, but um, people not in foster care. I feel somewhat ready. Um, I feel like the next step I'm going to adjust well to it. So just wait. So with that being said, do you feel as the system has failed you? Not really. Okay. Um, I've only been in for six months. I haven't been in for two years like um, she has. So I don't really know if it's failed me or not. OK. What about you? Um, I feel like I'm ready for this next step. Um, uh, my social worker is actually. Um, helps me um, excel in subjects, and I plan to attend Virginia Western Community College and then transfer to Radford University and pursue a PhD in psychology. Okay, wonderful. Um, <clears throat> my last question would be, um, you guys have been through a lot, and um, as Norma had mentioned earlier in her speech, there are about you know, 500,000 other foster youth that are going to soon be transitioning out of the foster care system. So my next question is, what, what words of wisdom would you have for them? What would you tell them um, as they you know, transition out? 
Uh, keep your head up. It's out of a song, but it's true because a lot of people are going to try to push you down and make things seem harder than what they really are. So just keep pushing. Um, I would tell younger people to use the resource. Like, don't be afraid to ask your social worker or um, like a, a fellow um, foster care um, member for help because it, it's going to be really useful. Um, I would tell younger people that never give up hope. Always have hope and to push yourself to your fullest potential. Thank you for sharing that. Um, now we'll um, open our conversation to the community. Um, if you have any questions, just raise your hand and one of the ushers will um, come to you with the mic. I work in an agency that works with families who are applying to be foster parents and we have a screening process and a training process they go through. What are some things that you all would like for us to tell or work with the families on who are considering taking foster children? Um, let's go with Shane with this one. Um, I would say that um, don't let the foster or the new parents come in with the attitude that every kid in foster care is bad. Um, there might be one out of ten kids that are actually bad in foster care. Um, I mean, me and Summer, um, we come out of foster care. We went into foster care because our mom passed away, and that's the reason that we are in here now, is because the care provided that she left us in the care of neglected us a little bit and so we had to fend for ourselves and the child protective agency came in and they said you, you can't do this um, so um, the social worker um, set us up luckily with a, a family that um, I, I felt comfortable with and then uh, Summer's uh, family um, didn't get along too well with them and uh, so she found another family that um, she did get along with, but don't let the parents come in with the attitude that everybody's bad. Rochelle? Uh, <clears throat> don't let the parents treat the kids like they're another paycheck. It's really about it, because a lot of parents, well, foster parents do use the kids as, oh, hey, I get free money every month. Okay, well, I just have to <laughs> let this kid live here. Summer, do you want to get it? Um, I, I guess um, to have the parents have communications with the um, foster kids because even though that we come from bad situations, like we have like a really good outlook on some of things and especially our own lives. So like I would just say communication. Next question. What is one thing, if you had to name one thing, that you would like to see the community do for you that they're not doing now, what would that be? Shane. Um, basically, just awareness. Um, just know that, you know, foster care is not something for bad kids. Uh, like I said, only like one out of ten kids is bad. And like Summer said, that. Um, Usually the kids that have like a bad situation, a bad life, actually makes the best out of that life. And that's just, you just need awareness. Summer? Um, I would say um, in the community, like let, um, let the youth in foster care, like the older youth, um, like go to meetings, like for um, like, council meetings and stuff um, for um, foster care too because like even though that we like some of us haven't been in there for so um, long like we still like kind of know it and stuff so I would just say let us like have a voice in the community. Okay. And Rochelle. Uh, be more understanding. Uh, touching on what Shane said not all foster kids are bad and not all foster kids come from bad situations, but yes, there are some that do have trust issues and have been in abusive homes and homes where their parents do drugs, make drugs, and it's a lot of people just 
don't get that. Um, just to touch on that, I mean, personally, I feel that <clears throat> educators um, should, you know, be held more accountable. Um, they're with children our age and below, you know, eight hours a day. And if they would just take a little bit t of time to, you know, show that child a little more attention that they know that's in, you know, in the foster youth to make sure everything's okay, make sure they're understanding the work material, I think that that will definitely increase the success rate of, you know, children uh, transitioning out of the foster care system. So um, educators definitely can play a big role in that. Next question. Yes, ma'am. I actually have two questions. Um, the first one is, Shane, you shared with us a little bit um, about you have the opportunity to be adopted. Um, Summer and Rochelle, my first question to you two is if that opportunity presented itself, is that something you would be interested in? And then the second one is you guys talked about communication as being one of the parts of something that would help your relationship with your social worker, but is there anything else that your social worker could be doing um, that they're not? All right, so let's start with the first question, part of the question, um, adoption. Adoption. Um, I don't think I would want to get adopted because I would feel like I was replacing my mom, and I don't want to do that at all. <laughs> so, like, it kind of just depends on where in life I was at, if I wanted to get adopted or not. Okay, and Rochelle? Uh, honestly, I would not like to be adopted at all. I'm 18. I mean, there's no real point in being adopted at this point. I still do talk to my biological family, and we are working on a better relationship, so it's not too horrible. <laughs> and now let's address the second part of the question. Um, do you feel like there's other things besides communications that your social worker could be doing? Correct? Jane? Um, not really. It's just the main topic of communication between the youth and the social worker. Maybe to be invited to a couple meetings, you know, that maybe the foster parents only are admitted to so they can listen to what their future is in store in foster care and so like that. Okay. And Summer? Um, other than communication, I would say, like, invite the older um, youth that understand like what's going on to all the meetings that they could come to to let them under like to let them know what's going on with their cases and stuff. Like, okay. I think that's important. All right, definitely. And Rochelle, for the social workers to not make all the decisions, let the kids be in on those meetings, and um, because especially for the older youth, you know. They know what they need, they know what they want, and, you know, they get told, oh, well, this is what you need to do. Okay, you're going to do this in this amount of time. But older youth, you know, you're going to have rebellious kids or teenagers, to rephrase that. They're not going to want to sit there and listen to every little word that the social worker is saying. Okay. All right, we have time for one more quick question. Yes, ma'am. Um, having heard all of your stories, I'm just interested to know if any of you are considering possibly being a foster parent in your future or mentoring foster children. I'll, I'll start with that question. Definitely. Um, I feel like, you know, having the experience that I've had that I'm almost obligated to take on that duty because I know, you know, how troublesome I, it can be and somewhat relate to a foster child. Um, so, yes, for me. Um, I would say that um, I would mentor uh, foster kids, not only foster kids, but youth, because as in my bio, if I don't make it in the United States military, I'd like to be a teacher, because my teachers have done so much for me, I'd like to give back to my teachers. And Summer? Um, I would become a foster mom, and I would um, adopt some kids, too, um, because I think it's important, like, I've had this experience, and it's been rocky. So, like, I think I think it's just like in my heart to give back to people that's helped me. Okay, and Rochelle. Uh, being a foster parent, maybe not. 
I might. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, mentoring, definitely. Okay. All right. Well, I'd like to thank everyone um, for your questions and your interest in foster care. And again, thank everyone who made this opportunity possible. Um, I hope that you've learned a lot um, from us and will help us tell the story to the community. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, and we need your help. Thank you.